So first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. <clears throat> you know, I know there's a lot of competition this morning on some great, great speech topics, so thank you for joining. And uh, hopefully we make the uh, time, time worth it. Uh, to make it worth it, uh, I'd like to really encourage you guys to ask questions. Um, I can prattle on here for my entire allotted time, but, but love to get interrupted, love to get your thoughts, love to get your feedback. So please feel comfortable doing that. But by way of quick introduction, my name is Dean Henry. I lead the global high volume payments team at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And we're a product management team. And, and within our scope of responsibilities are the traditional high volume products like ACH, our check payment products globally. Um, but also uh, within our business is a new area that is digital payments. Um, we're very excited about digital payments. And the purpose and the scope of today's um, talk is really to highlight why we think digital payments is going to be a new payment type that, that as treasurers or as consumers of banking services, you will look at wires, ACH, check, and digital as a new payment type within the next 12 to 18 months. And I want to walk through some of the thinking that we have gone through as an organization to try to reach this conclusion. And I would encourage you guys to, to uh, in your questions, affirm whether or not you agree or, or uh, tell us that we're crazy. The feedback's always good. Um, and, and in order to tell that story, I want to walk through four different, four different areas. First, I want to talk about what are, what are the global uh, uh, innovation trends that are really shaping the way that our innovation teams at Bank of America and Merrill Lynch are thinking about uh, payments and what's coming next. Second problem I want to highlight is the high volume, low value cross-border problem. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth in high volume, low value payments and not a lot of great options out there for those enterprises that generate them. Then I want to touch on a couple models for how you could solve that cross-border problem. And then I want to give you a, a glimpse at a product that we're launching, but then also uh, a product set with these technologies that we think are, will be coming out into the market as, as this space continues to mature. So in order to first highlight, you know, what is our innovation team at Bank of America thinking about generically across our entire transaction services business, there are three main trends that, that we are hyper aware of that trickle down into every aspect of our business. First thing is demographic shifts. You know, our workforce globally is getting younger, um, and with that, they take different expectations into the kind of services and the, and the capabilities that they want to use um, either as a supplier to a business or as a treasury manager of an existing business. Second thing is globalization. And the fact is, is that when you look at where, where the industry and the world is growing, there are, there are a tremendous amount of growth and new revenue opportunities and new geographies that, that uh, many companies haven't thought about before. And then the, the last trend is uh, cross-border commerce. The fact that you can set a website up and have a buyer and a seller live in two different geographies is an old cliche that we all are very well aware of. But at this point, it's really driving a tremendous amount of volume in terms of cross-border payments that are high in volume but low in value. And so when we think about the demographic shift that's happening today, what's amazing to me is that within nine years, you're going to have 75% of the workforce being millennials. So I have a lot of millennials on my team, and they are a special kind of, of breed. Um, they take a lot of tender, loving care. But 75% of the people that we interact with, whether you're a banker or whether you're a, a, a business that has suppliers, everybody's going to be a millennial. And with that, they take different expectations into how they want to interact with you. They are much more excited about new technology. They are much more plugged in. And they are much more cognizant of, of how they interact in their day-to-day -day and, and how that day-to-day -day interaction with services, media, banking, in the retail side should for the most part, mirror what they're doing on their wholesale uh, banking services. They're very excited about new services from companies like Amazon and Apple in financial services. That is, if nothing else, for the banking industry, a wake-up call that we need to be thinking about, well, who are we working with? Who are we partnering with to ultimately serve this customer segment? The second part is globalization. 
and where the population's moving. So if you're a business and you want to grow faster than US GDP or European GDP, you're necessarily going to the places where population's growing. And so the blue bar at the bottom is Africa, the middle bar is Asia, Europe, LATAM, and then North America at the top. What's interesting is that, that the population is, is growing 33% over, over the next decades. 91% of that population growth is coming from emerging markets within Africa and Asia, while you see traditional um, markets like Europe shrinking in terms of their overall um, market share or percentage of the population by a third within that same time frame. And so following that population growth is the money movement and the forecast on where money is going to move. So if you look at the gray bar at the bottom here, this is, these are volumes by region. So Western Europe, North America, Asia mature, Asia emerging in the middle, Latin America, et cetera. And then at the bottom, you can see the compound the annual growth rates of each one of these regions. Perhaps not surprising where the population is growing in Africa and especially in emerging Asia, you're seeing a huge spike in cross-border payments. And these regions are, are areas of the world that are not always banked or don't have the same sort of infrastructure that we enjoy in North America and Europe. And so when you consider these, very, these three very basic trends, and this is summarizing a tremendous amount of research that our innovation and strategy teams have, have looked at, there, there are five simple things that we know create the next round of cross-border payment challenges for us. But I saw a hand go up, so I want to pause for that question. So this slide and this data set represent the, the cross-border payments. So it is from country A to country B, um, and is both inbound and outbound. So, so the slice of this that, that we're very interested in is obviously the inbound, um, which market by market is, is about you know, 42 to 45 percent of the total payment volumes are inbound. So good question. All right. So, so the problems that these just three very general statements about what's happening in the, in the world of payments or in the world of, of business, it, it creates sort of five things that, that we know that we're dealing with as, as a, a global payments team. One is that we're going to have an increasing number of consumers and small and medium sized enterprises that are, are transacting today in today's global business. They're going to be doing that in new global locations. And many of those new global locations are in developing countries that have local payment systems that are not always driven by banks. And they're going to take those expectations that the millennials have today and that they will have tomorrow and have real-time mobile uh, expectations on how they, they interact with us as financial institutions, but also how they interact with themselves and, and, and pay their suppliers and their consumers. So when you think about those five problems or those, those, that reality that we're painting, then you want to step back and you think about a wire and what are some of the traditional challenges that, that banks have today with the way wires work globally. The, the column on the far left of this page highlights the obvious issues that if you're sending wires in volume, you all know. And one of the main problems is that you don't know frequently how much money is going to be deposited into a beneficiary's account because of all the lifting fees that happen uh, as money moves from correspondent bank A to correspondent bank B, et cetera. On top of the fact that it takes multiple days, on top of the fact that you don't really know um, where the payment is in the process, um, on top of the fact that we're constrained with data. And so when we think about where, where those trends are leading us, the next generation and the new requirements in payments are going to be much more retail oriented. So the things that you guys do perhaps on a day-to-day -day basis, buying things online or sending money to friends and family um, are going to start to creep their way into wholesale payments as well. 
There, there's a huge need for data flexibility, as we all know, in order to aid reconciliation. There's a, there's a big need for banks to be collaborating with some of these non-financial um, non institutions that are moving a tremendous amount of money in these geographies, and they need to act more like a retail payment, mobile wallets being a great example of that. So you take those trends, and then you consider the fact that mobile phones are more ubiquitous than clean water in many countries in the world, and that more than 70% of the global population had a, had a mobile phone in their hands in 2014, and that number has increased from that, from that point to today. There's a huge ubiquity of ability to communicate with, um, with suppliers and customers that need to pay each other, interact in, in commerce. And so with that tee up, there are two things that we're really interested in in terms of the next set of solutions for global payments. Mobile networks are one of them, and I'm going to presume that everybody in this room is familiar with, with uh, PayPal as a metaphor, because all, all of these examples are basically networks that perform similarly to PayPal. So before I dive into this, I want to give credit where credit's due. Most of the good ideas that we, we receive as a team come from our clients, and the, and the first time we really started looking at mobile payment networks as an option for business-to-consumer or business-to-supplier payments was when a large uh, client of ours that buys a lot of commodities in Africa came up to us, and, and the treasurer was explaining to me um, a problem that he had. He said, you know, we're buying truckloads of commodities in, in Africa from local farmers. They're, they're dropping off these truckloads of, of, of the commodity, and we're, we have a treasury employee who's paying that uh, farmer in cash. And in order to ensure that the box of cash that uh, treasury employee uh, has does not disappear, we have armed guards with rifles standing right behind the, the uh, employee. And his, his simple comment to me was, I've got to eliminate rifles from my payment process. And, and, and so we, we, we agreed with that. And, and it started us, really that one comment, that one conversation started us on, on this journey to really look at mobile payment networks. Um, and it got, and we, we got more energy around it because you know, tragically, actually, that same company had an employee that was murdered in that exact same uh, circumstance. So, so it was um, you know, about as dramatic as payments gets. Um, and, and there's a real need for that company to find a new solution. So when we step back from, from that perhaps extreme example, because not everybody's buying commodities from, from uh, farmers in rural Africa, we, if we step back and we look at, well, what do these mobile networks really do? And they basically do three things that we're very, very interested in. The first thing is, is they have solved local regulations. So in every one of these markets, they're complying with local law, and they're moving around money uh, that meets the ever-changing uh, needs of local governments. It's been a huge struggle for Bank of America and any other global bank is to make sure that we're doing what local governments want us to do to ensure that the bad guy doesn't get paid. Second thing that, that they have is economies of scale. So they have more options to move money around, pull money down, or put money, frankly, into the local banking system, if that's what the beneficiary wants to do, then Bank of America or any other global bank could, could recreate. So if we partnered with them, we'd, we'd realize some of their economies of scale. And the third thing they have is ubiquity. So in each one of the markets that, that uh, we've highlighted here, and, and frankly, in every other country in, in the globe, because of the penetration of mobile phones, um, you have a growing ubiquity with payment networks that are, are uh, you know, if united and if integrated, are frankly the single biggest, uh, most ubiquitous method of moving money globally. But they are right now all islands that are not integrated and have been largely ignored by banks. Second technology I want to. I want to talk about, and this is a bit of a tough transition. So I'm moving from really excited about mobile payment networks to now I'm pretty excited about blockchain. And more, gener more generally, distributed ledgers. So there's been a lot of talk 
uh, at this conference and a lot of talk within the industry about the power of blockchain. And I want to quickly define it um, just so we have a common definition and then I'm going to talk about a specific example where we're very interested. So, so as we all know, Bitcoin created uh, blockchain, the, the ability to have two wallets and having a central ledger that clears and settles a transaction is and was uh, rather unique because it's a completely cloud-based payment system. We are obviously not interested in the virtual currency component of this, but the ability to clear and settle a transaction without the dependence on a local clearing system or a local um, bank is very interesting to us. And, and frankly, the ability to then authorize, authenticate, and assign value to almost anything um, and digitize that, that in a, a ledger is incredibly powerful. And the last thing that's incredibly powerful is that you can, it has a tremendous amount of data flexibility to add information that's needed to that transaction in order to do things like straight through reconciliation that we as an industry talk a tremendous amount about. And it does all these things that are on this page that I won't read through as well, but a tremendously flexible um, method of clearing and settling transactions alongside a whole host of mobile payment networks that are little islands of compliant money movement. So then, so I borrowed this artwork from Ripple because I thought that they did a nice job of illustrating a use case that, that they first highlighted, but there are a lot of solutions out there, so I'm not endorsing Ripple per se, but I think the, the uh, image was powerful. So imagine, this scenario being democratized. So if you're a global multinational and you want to pay or have your US subsidiary pay your European subsidiary, very rarely do you actually move money. You debit one ledger, you credit another ledger, and in the middle you have a currency hedging operation or you have a bank manage your currency hedging operation. And so money doesn't actually move, but value moves. What's interesting here with, with the way Ripple has, has uh, depicted this is Ripple calls uh, that functionality, that multinational led, distributed ledger functionality, the market maker. So if you want to make a payment and you're, you're a, an originator of a payment at Bank A in the US and you want to pay somebody at Bank B that might be in some country in, in Europe, you can in effect do a real-time payment from, from Bank A to Bank B by, by doing a book transfer at Bank A to the market maker's account at Bank A, and then do another book transfer at Bank B from the market maker's account to Bank B at the, the uh, um, beneficiary's account. What that's doing is basically uh, utilizing cash that's already patriated and already available in those accounts. And, and the, the uh, system and the distributed ledger in the middle is crediting that transaction and keeping track of that transaction. And so imagine a world where if you excuse me. Uh, imagine a world where if you if you open that up and you had multiple points of connection through the cloud through a distributed ledger that allowed you know me as an individual, if I have a bank account at any bank or any two banks, I can and the tolerance to, to uh, hedge currency, I can become a market maker. Banks can open that up to other, other banks, other financial institutions that they want to partner with and uh, work with. Tremendous basic concept that I think aligns very nicely with mobile payment networks that are all of these islands of, of compliance and ubiquity. Because there's a need to unite the, unite the uh, islands. So when I look like so when I look out and I say, well, well what's going to happen? What are how are banks actually going to utilize these capabilities to solve some of these very real cross-border payment problems that I talked about? And Bank of America has a product out that my team uh, has deployed within North America that is called Digital Disbursements, and it's the product on the left. And what it allows is for a, a, an insurance company or any any entity to make a payment directly to a consumer by only asking the consumer to provide an email address or a mobile phone number. 
And that's because it's leveraging the person-to-person -person payment network that powers uh, most of the large banks within the US, um, their ability to, to do P2P transfers. We're building on that concept. And, when you, and then when you think back to all these mobile payment networks globally, what we want to be able to do is in the next uh, version of this product, which we're coming out with uh, hopefully here in, in November, is provide our corporation's choice to be able to say, well, how do we want to pay beneficiaries? And then let that beneficiary actually decide, well, how do they want to get paid? And, and so in the example that we have, you, know, you might want to send a payment to somebody and allow them to say, I want to get a prepaid solution. You know, it could be a gift card, but it doesn't have to be a gift card. It could be a traditional prepaid product. You could use a, mo a mobile payment network. You know, there, you know, it's PayPal in this example, but it could be Alipay if you're moving money in China. It could be M-Pesa if you're moving money in Africa. The card networks have a tremendous capability that, that they are now opening up. So if, you, so if you guys have ever used a debit card to go to return a product that you purchased at a store and you had a refund sent to your debit card, um, that payment type of sending money directly into your bank account via a debit card is now opened up by Visa and MasterCard such that you can push a payment to, to a business or a consumer by asking for their debit card number. And you can do that uh, uh, within the US, but they're also opening this up in the near term globally. So it's yet another payment type that sits alongside the options that we as, as treasurers have or we as, as bankers have in order to move money. And these, these capabilities are completely customizable, but then also completely ab uh, able to be deployed inside of, of uh, digital environments via APIs. So let's say you're a, uh, you know, an easy example is, is uh, an insurance company. So if you're an insurance company and you're running around uh, as a, a claims adjuster looking at somebody's car, assessing the damage of the car, and you would traditionally hand them a paper check, you might and you might be recording the damage within a mobile pain or mobile app. Uh, you you using this capability would be able to pull in these payment types and say, how would you like to get paid? Read it off to the policyholder and say and say you would like to get paid via PayPal. Let me enter in your email address. Your money's there real time. It has huge applicability across all kinds of different areas. So if you're moving money, you know. Uh, Another easy example is think about Google. Google has millions and millions of app developers that they pay globally. And, and they are accruing all of these payments and, and very little inc uh, small increments and they need a much better path to pay uh, these app developers other than a wire. But then it also applies directly to any sort of, of uh, company that's doing business with suppliers in some of these emerging markets. You know, a lot of these emerging markets uh, suppliers have the ability to receive a payment via the mobile payment networks because that's how they're already interacting within their marketplace. So it doesn't have to be as unique as Google or unique as the insurance company. It can be as generic as I need to pay a supplier in one of these local markets. These mobile payment networks are a real viable option that, that are already moving money in those markets. So the, the medium term concept and where we get really excited about this is when you put these two things together and, and there's a tremendous uh, democratization of moving money globally that when you take this market maker concept that I talked about that really is just account at, at institution A and account at institution B and the ability to, to um, take a, a currency risk. And then you integrate those with all of the different mobile payment networks that exist globally. This is tremendously powerful and something that can completely move money inside of existing uh, uh, very mature markets, but then also inside of very unmature markets that are very much developing. And when I show the slide at Bank of America, you know, I get a lot of people saying, well, the compliance on this is going to be impossible and like there's no way you're going to be able to do this. And, and I actually, uh, in some ways think that the compliance is, is difficult. But the thing as financial institutions and, and my sort of personal call to action for the financial industry is that we can actually make this possible. And if you look at banks 
and the, the core value that banks bring to the financial institution, which is the safety and soundness, the compliance, the screening, the ability to ensure that the bad person isn't getting paid. Um, we can actually make money movement happen in this way, and we can actually make it happen uh, with the full you know, safety and soundness that you expect from a financial institution. There's one, one more story I want to talk about, because this is actually happening on a small scale. So we have a client of ours that's a, a charity. And that charity is trying to figure out how they, they distribute funds to the local charities that ultimately uh, fund the local service providers to, to give services to a needy group of, of uh, people. And their main problem that they have is that they want to ensure that when they give money to a local charity that actually provides a, a service to a population, that the money turns into vaccinations, that it doesn't turn into um, contraband. Pick your favorite contraband. And they've actually had real problems with this. So they, they went out, they, they bought you know, 100,000 vaccinations for a population. They hired a local vendor, um, that local vendor said that they went out and, and delivered all those vaccinations and they delivered back to the local charity the empty 100,000 vials of, of that vaccination. And what they then later found out was that that local supplier had actually just stuck all the needles in the ground and, and emptied out the vaccinations into the mud. And so they, they have decided that they need a way to move money from their headquarter charity to a local charity to then to a subcontracting charity to, who ultimately hires a vendor to only pay the vendor when they get information back about the services being rendered. And their you know, pictures, other, other, uh, other data points that they need. This is actually not that hard for this charity to build. Because if you think about the technologies that exist today, you know, it's not that hard to recreate PayPal with a small community. It's not that hard to define how money moves out into a local economy and the information you need back based on the available options of, of taking money out of a closed loop network in a local economy. This is, I believe, coming to a, a channel near us. When you think about the fact that cloud-based uh, clearing and settlement networks that integrate with digital networks that are either already existing or customized. There's a whole lot of flexibility that can happen here about deploying a customized payment network for a large company that wants very specific things to happen. And I think the cost is going to come down. And the, and the generic example I would point to as, as to why costs and all things and technologies come down can be as easy as, you know, considering my, my, my career. You know, when I started off, I worked at Booz Allen Hamilton and e-business consulting in, in the late 90s. And we were charging millions and millions of dollars to set up a very basic e-commerce website for any business. And now, today, for $20 a month, you can get something that is, you know, 10 times as flexible, 10 times as robust as what we were setting up, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And, and it's all online, it's all available, it's completely customizable. I think payments are going to do the same thing. And we're going to see a need for banks to have to think about how do we actually partner with the fintech companies that are causing this disruption? How do we bring the assets that we, we uh, um, have as an, en as an en industry as well as an enterprise to make this happen but do so in a way that accomplishes everybody's objectives which are safety and soundness of, of the money movement, compliance with local law and regulation, and the ability to ensure that if you're working with a financial institution, you want to move money seamlessly, better, faster, cheaper, using these technologies, we can help you. So Bank America and my team specifically is very focused on the near-term solution, which I highlighted, which is, hey, we want to look at these as, as a short-run ability for corporates to pay small businesses and consumers in, in these global geographies, but, but we also have an eye to where it could go, and we're thinking a lot about this, and we think there's a lot of, pro of promise and potential. Question? Thank you very much. I'm just looking at something similar to Dr. Newman, so I was just going to say, from a corporate, I need that to go to another bank, right? I need that to be that more flexible to obtain that now. Exactly. So, 
Yeah, do you mind restating the, the, the uh, yeah. 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 Actually, if you could repeat it to me, I didn't quite well, hear right. it as well. I'm just saying on the second by this model, but as a corporate, I need that end efficiency of the whole thing that works, right? Right. I need to get into market dynamics. That's a great question. So the, so the statement was he's excited about the model, but as a corporate, he actually needs the money to get into a bank account. And, um, and I agree with that statement, but, but take PayPal as an example, because it can actually get into a bank account. So PayPal um, allows you to associate a bank account to its, its um, uh, alias, the email address or the mobile phone number, or a card, or, or it has a stored value or a prepaid component to it. And a lot of these um, mobile networks have the ability to actually connect to the local pay, uh, banking system and just push money directly into a DBA account um, or the equivalent. So that is happening, but then the other thing that we're looking at, well, what are some of the other networks that exist out there that we can bring to bear that just put money into a, a DBA account, that's what you want. And, and candidly, we've already done that. Um, we have a partnership with Earthport that allows us to put money into um, uh, countries where we just don't have a, a branch or a correspondent relationship, and so we've been putting money uh, into markets that way. But there are strengths there are, and weaknesses of that model as well, and and we're trying to uh, figure out well how do we complement that with um, with uh, flexible systems that move money. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, do you see a way to solve that as easily as possible? Yes. We want to provide you with those services, and, I, and we're not unique. Any bank wants to provide you with those services. FX is a, a big component to what we do and how we want to grow. Um, the reason that those fees are so high is because banks aren't playing in that, in that space right now, and that the providers, you know, the pioneers of the world, Zoom, others can charge that much, especially in person-to-person -person remittances right now. If we, we brought our time, attention, and focus to this marketplace, we'd be able to bring a lot of economies of scale that we have in, in our FX markets and our ability to, to uh, charge uh, a, a more realistic spread and, and then help you move the money and, and do so in these ways. So we... So we take it on as, uh, you know, our plan with Bank of America is to do that with, with uh, this product right here. Um, we, will, we will enable you to send money to, uh, you know, pick your, your favorite mobile network in a, in a growing economy. We'll convert the, the currency for you, and we'll pay, pay out the beneficiaries in local currency, but we're not going to charge you the same, same rate that you would get if you were an individual going to uh, Payoneer, as an easy example. Good question, thank you for that. Any other questions? Okay, well I've enjoyed my, uh, my time. Thank you for listening to me. Um, that's the end of my prepared remarks and uh, welcome to uh, talk with anybody afterwards or, or talk more about our future plans offline if, if you're uh, so inclined. But thank you very much. Thank you.